Hi, my name is Robert Earl with the Digital Agent Show. Today I want to share with you 21 mistakes that I made when I got into real estate. Now, the reason I'm making this video, honestly, is that uh, I wish somebody would have had this type of honest, forthright discussion with me when I first got into real estate back in 2001. I wanted answers to the questions that I had and I wanted them to be delivered to me in a straightforward process so that I could avoid some of the mistakes that I made. The, the second reason is obviously that I want to be able to provide guidance to individuals such as yourself that are looking to get into real estate or have just started your real estate career. If I can help you, if I can prevent you from making even a couple of the mistakes that I made when I first got into real estate, then this video will be worthwhile. So let's get started. Let me share with you the 21 mistakes that I felt that I made when I first got into real estate. Now here's the thing. I know I got, back, I got into real estate back in 2001, so you're probably saying, well, the industry has probably evolved, it's changed. Well, when I work with new individuals looking to get in the business, just like yourself, I hear about all 21 of these items still occurring at real estate companies today. So mistake number one that I made is I went into the real estate class thinking that the class was actually going to teach me how to sell real estate. I signed up for the class, I paid my dues, I got my textbook, I rushed home, I started reading it, and as I went through the book, it was gonna show me how to sell real estate. I got through chapter one. Lots of facts, a lot of information that I had to memorize, a lot of figures and laws that had been created many, many years ago, and I just didn't see how they applied. So I thought, well, maybe chapter two, uh, maybe like a slow movie that this will be able to uh, start to reveal itself. I slogged through chapter two, got through the information, got to chapter three. It was dry. The information was very dry. It was a lot of, like I said, facts, figures, list, terminology, glossaries of terms that had to be memorized and be able to go through it. It reminded me of being back in high school where they gave you the Pythagorean theorem and you sat there and you kind of thought, when am I ever going to use this in my life? There must have been a mistake. I signed up for a real estate class. I thought it was going to talk about how to work with buyers and sellers. I must have gotten the wrong book. I didn't understand how I could make such a mistake. So I thought when I got into the classroom, it would be better that the instructor would be able to uh, share more information. They'd be able to go over more of the details of it. Well, if you've ever seen a Charlie Brown episode where the teacher is talking wah, 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 that is what the real estate class seemed like. They were just rereading the same material that I had gone over. Occasionally they would say, highlight this, this might be on the test, this might be information. So that was something that I've gone through. I went through two different highlighters during the course of my first couple weeks of the first couple classes. So here's what I've since realized. The real estate class, the real estate course, is designed for two reasons if you approach it this way. It is to satisfy the hours that the state has laid out and to pass the final exam. The, that is the purpose of the class. The class is designed to give you the information that you're going to have to recall, memorize and recall, on a multiple choice test at the end of it. The course in and of itself, a lot of the information, financial calculations, yes, you need to know how to do them, but when you get into the field, when you actually start selling real estate, your mortgage professionals, your title companies will assist you with this. When it comes time to understanding meets and bounds and surveys, that's the reason that they have surveyors. When it comes time to understanding information about commercial real estate, if that's your specialty, then you'll be able to go into more information. But the class itself is designed for you to be able to satisfy the hours that the state requires and then to be able to pass the freaking test. 
Mistake number two that I made is I took a classroom course. This turned out to be a mistake for me for a couple of reasons. One had to do with the time schedule and the required hours. I had a situation come up in the third class. It was actually parent-teacher conference week. I had to attend to the parent-teacher conference and was not going to be able to make it into the real estate class at that time. Now, I thought the instructor would uh, have a makeup session or there would be something involved with that. That was not the policy of the real estate school. And I hear about this still going on to this day, that I had to wait until the next time that session three, chapter three was being taught and it comes to find out that the next time that it was being taught was many weeks later. So I got done with my class, but I had to go back and do a makeup exam, and I was not allowed to take the course test until I had finished this. This delayed the amount of time that I was able to go through. The second reason that the classroom course was very, very frustrating for myself was the other students. You see, I had a couple students, they still stick in my mind. One of them was Debbie Downer. Every single thing was just, and every conversation was brought down to that particular level of this individual. Another individual, they were the why type of person. They would ask question after question after question. Why, why, why? And then it breaks. It was the same type of thing. Matter of fact, I found myself in a couple of classes going to my car so that I didn't have to deal with all of the negativity or the other questions. See, this individual was asking questions, why were laws a particular way? And I'm sure it'd be fascinating to find out what was going on in the history of the state at that particular time when they passed that particular law. But for the purposes of the course, I just needed to know if that is the particular law, if this is a protected class under fair housing, I needed to be able to memorize that information and I needed to be able to then recall it on the test. I didn't need to know why in very few re uh, cases that I need to know why, but I needed to be able to go through it and go through those. So the other students in the class weren't as committed as I was to get through the course and to get out into the real estate profession. So here's what I found. The way in which the test is designed, the multiple choice questions, the way in which you read the questions, and the way in which you go through the answers, that was more important than the instructor's explanation than the other students. And also I found that I was repeating information that I had already read at home and then I was coming into the class and it was being read again. So this was very frustrating to me to be able to go through. I needed to be able to set my schedule and be able to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish because during this period of time that I was taking the classes, I wasn't yet making money. And we'll go and in, get into that point in just a bit. The number three mistake that I made is I did not have an exam prep module or an exam preparation book. The textbook that I had in the class that I took had one quiz in it of 50 questions. And when you went through those 50 questions, in the back of the book, was the answer key. So it would tell you it was A, B, C, C, A, but it did not provide the reasons why an answer was a particular way. Now, while I was going through the course, there was a book report due for one of my, my kids. So we actually went to Barnes and Noble. You remember there used to be bookstores. We went to a Barnes and Noble to pick up a book for this particular book report. And while I was there, I came across a exam preparation book that had sampled test questions in it. Now all that is available online, but it had that information so that I would be able to take the sample test questions over and over and over again. So I was able to get through this. 
within the 100 pages of sample test questions, I got to the point where I was able to take those and I was able to pass at a 80, 85, 90% basis so that when it came time to actually take the test, even if I got nervous, even if I had a brain cramp, I was still going to be able to pass. So here's what I've since learned. It's very important when you sign up for a course. When I took my real estate class the second time, because I took it the first time when I was in Virginia, then when I moved to Florida, I had to retake the entire course from scratch. So whether you take the classroom or you take an online course, it's very important that you either buy a package or you spend a little bit more for an investment for an exam preparation module so that you'll have those sample test questions. While I was still working nine to five, doing coaching of other agents when I moved to Florida and was taking the class part time, majority of my focus was not on the class, was not on the reading materials. I did the reading materials to satisfy the hours because my online course gave me credit for doing that and I didn't have to repeat the time when I was in a classroom. And I would say that probably 65, 70% of my time was spent on sample test questions. And if I got one wrong, the exam prep module would give me the information as to which one was correct. Now, mistake number four that I made is I didn't spend enough time outside of the classroom to study when I first took the course. This goes back to the approach that I was in class, I was listening, and I heard over and over and over again, this will be on the test, this will be on the test, this will be on the test, this will be on the test. And really, it was a large amount of information that was trying to be put into uh, too many potatoes trying to be put into a five pound potato sack if you can picture that overflowing it's when i got the exam prep book that it actually started to make sense to me that i needed to spend time not only reading outside of class but i need to be preparing for the exam that was going to be given so what I've since realized is that if you understand what's being asked of you, you can better approach the situation. Let me give you an example. A Rubik's Cube can be solved in a set number of ways. I don't have to think about every single time. There's actually patterns that you can follow to be able to solve a Rubik's Cube. The multiple choice test questions are the same way when it comes to real estate, that you'll be able to approach it, you'll be able to go through and set aside really a period of time to be able to get through the course and pass the exam. What I've realized as well in my discussions with other individuals that are looking to get into real estate is they take far too long to go through the course and to pass the test. They think that it's going to be a six month process to be able to go through it. And here's what happens. They forget anything they learned in month one and month two. And when it comes time to actually sit down for the exam in month six or seven, they've forgotten. They have to go back through the information and they have to go over and over again. Or another situation that I see over and over again is they take the exam, they somehow get through the final of the exam. When it comes time to prepare for the independent state slash national exam, they never take the time to set for it and actually do this. And so then it becomes a year or two later, they reach out, they contact Digital Agent Show or myself, and they're asking, well, what can I do to activate my license? And what ends up happening is they have to go back and take the course over. It's like a Rubik's Cube. Once you figure it out, you'll be able to actually solve it. So mistake number five that I made when I got into real estate is I went with the real estate company that was actually hosting the real estate course. Here's what I've since learned. 
real estate schools and real estate companies are separate entities and have to be independent. The states require that. They don't want people to just get rubber stamped for their real estate license and then be passed on. The reason that I went with that company is I thought that it would give me a leg up, that I was going to be one of their uh, uh, favorite sons, shall we say, when I actually got on board. Well, during the course of the uh, exam, the broker did actually poke his head in once or twice. As a matter of fact, I think they even bought pizza for the class one time, although Debbie Downer thought that it was the wrong type of pizza, so you could see how the atmosphere of the classroom went. Uh, so I went through this situation, went with the brokerage, but it did not provide me a leg up. I was just a number when I got into the system. Luckily, one mistake that I didn't fall for was joining a real estate company that offered to pay for my real estate class. I had an individual last year that this was the offer. They offered, the real estate company offered to pay for the real estate class for this individual. Once they finally joined the company, they had a required period of time that they had to work with that company and comes to find out that their commission split and fees were greater, meaning they had to pay the brokerage, the company, more, they got less in their pocket because of this real estate class. So this $150 to $500 investment in the class actually ended up costing this individual thousands of dollars. So here's what I've really found about this. Real estate companies, a lot of real estate companies, want you to jump through hoops so that you feel like that you're being hired by them. That's not the case. You're not applying for a job if you approach this correctly. Job meaning just over broke. For a lot of you that are watching this, you're trying to get out of a situation where you're working in a job. You're trying to get in a position where you have greater flexibility, where you have freedom. And now you're going to be in a situation where you're being hired by the brokerage. They want you to do this because they have a model that they want you to be dependent upon the broker or the brand. And so this is really not the model that has worked best for me and for a number of successful agents and teams that I've worked with over the year. The model that has worked is that you are making an investment to start your own business and you're looking for the right environment to partner with. The way I like to look at it is I'm looking for a real estate company that stands behind me and supports me, not one that stands in front of me and blocks me out. And I'll talk about that a little bit further in some of the mistakes. So are you going to treat this like a business that you're starting or are you going to treat this like just another job? A lot of brokerages, you'll see the sign out in front of them that says, now hiring new agents. They actually have the mentality that they want you to think about being hired. Job just overbroke. Mistake number six, I thought the brand name of the real estate company mattered and because of it, I would get more real estate business. I mean, this particular company that I joined, they ran a full page ad every single weekend with all of their open houses in the Washington Post. What could be better? I'd be able to walk into a property, I'd be able to show them, hey, your property is gonna be advertised out here in the Washington Post, and because of that, there, this company was at the time number one or number two going back and forth within the area. With all of this in place, I thought that people would be flocking to my door or ringing the phone off the hook wanting to buy homes or sell homes. Now with that brand name, they also required me to do set hours within the office. Because of that advertising, the phone number that was listed for the advertisements was the office phone number. And I'll talk about that in just a second as to another mistake that I made. So 
the agent was actually acting as the receptionist in the office. And if there was a buyer that was unattached, then you had an opportunity to actually turn those folks into a buyer and a seller. But because I was a new agent, the duty time that I was given was four days after the newspaper had already come out. By that time, the newspaper was already being used to wrap fish or to line a parakeet cage. It really did nothing to increase phone calls. So here's what I've since learned. My knowledge about the local area, my expertise, my professionalism is what buyers or sellers were looking for. And they would choose to work with me because of the information that I brought, not because of the brand that I was with. I know because I switched brands and those customers and those clients actually came with me. You see, the National Association of Realtors survey of buyers and sellers backs this up. They indicate that less than 3%, 2.5%, 3% of buyers and sellers actually pick their agent because of the company that they're with. And it's far down on the list in comparison to the other items. This is your business that you are going to make relationships and individuals are gonna to choose to work with you, not the brand. Yes, it matters to be backed by a professional brand, yet it's not the main reason why you should join a real estate company. Mistake number seven, I went with a real estate company that did not allow me to sell during my onboard training process. You see, I joined the company and they had a two week everyday program that I had to go through. And when I went through this program, it would teach me, one of the things for open houses, very informative, is there were items that I needed to bring with me in putting together an open house kit, like coloring books for kids or extra toilet paper. Well, okay, I'm glad that I found that out, but a lot of the course was designed to protect the brokerage, not teaching me how to sell real estate. Obviously, when you're getting into real estate, you're going to be excited. You're going to share with individuals, hey, I'm getting into real estate. Hey, I got my license. And Murphy's Law is going to show up. Somebody within your realm is going to want to either look for an investment property or they want to buy or they want to sell. And I was in a situation where I was handcuffed. I was not able to do anything with them. Matter of fact, the policy was, is that I had to sign a referral agreement with this individual, not knowing any better, I did that. It got assigned to another agent, meaning that I wouldn't get the full portion. I would have to pay the company for submitting this lead over to the company. It got submitted over. I followed up with the individuals about a week later saying, hey, how's it going? Are you looking for homes? Have you gone through? And it was crickets. They had not heard from anybody in the company. So this was really my reputation that I had talked to these individuals and said, hey, somebody from the company will be calling you back. And they didn't. And I was in a position where I could not assist them because of my agreement. So here's what I've since learned. When I first got into real estate, I didn't know how to work with buyers and sellers. I understand that. But if I would have had the opportunity, take the example that I gave and work with this particular buyer or seller and go get an experienced agent and make sure that I stayed in the loop, I would have gladly paid that other agent 70, 80, even 90% of the commission that it would allow me to learn that would allow me to be mentored through this relationship, but it would also allow me to retain the relationship with the potential buyer and seller. From day one, especially if you're going to be doing this as a part-time agent hoping to become full-time, you need to work with a full-time agent and be able to pass along, but still retain that relationship with 
that potential buyer and seller. You see, I'd rather get a percentage of something than 100% of nothing. Mistake number eight that I made is I put too much faith in my managing broker. You see, the real estate class does one thing very, very well. It teaches you all of the ways in which you can get fined and you can get sued. And therefore, it places your broker or your managing broker almost in a position of being a deity that you have to check every single thing with. And yes, you do have to be in compliance with your broker, but I actually gave my broker too much credit. You see, the broker was not really someone that I could turn to for business advice. I turned to the broker. I did ask for some business advice on a potential listing that was coming up. They gave me what I later found out to be very generic information. And I also found out why they did that. Stay tuned. So what I've since learned, I respect the role of the broker in any office. Many times when you're in a tough situation with a transaction, you need the broker to be able to call upon. But the broker being there to ensure that the brand of the company is being used correctly, there to referee disputes between agents, that's really not a healthy model. You see, I'm an independent contractor. Compliance is one thing, but I need someone that is there to be able to help me in growing my business. Because at the end of the day, the real estate company's not paying my mortgage and my broker's not paying my mortgage. I need the ability to have a trusted advisor that I can turn to. And I really put too much faith in my broker when I first got into real estate. Mistake number nine, I went with a company that didn't teach me how to generate my own business. Other agents in the office didn't share any ideas, didn't share any of their promotions. It was always the focus of the particular broker. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't have the information that was able to go through and find buyers and sellers. The biggest thing that happened was, again, I go back to the open houses. They taught me where the balloon machine was. They taught me how to fill up the balloons. They taught me how to stand in a house for four hours and hope that someone showed up. It was a very passive form of real estate and it did not provide me with the number of buyers and sellers that I really needed to be able to work with to be successful in the real estate business. Because I wasn't being taught how to sell with the real estate company, I went home and I remember that a former boss that I'd worked with listened to Zig Ziglar on some cassettes in his car when I would ride along with him. And Zig Ziglar would talk about sales. Zig Ziglar had done door-to-door -door sales in the past and was a motivational speaker. Well, this led me to going and searching for Zig Ziglar. And I actually got online and started to, well, I ended up on eBay. And when I ended up on eBay, I was looking for real estate sales trainers that had cassette tapes. They had cassette tape packages. One was of their superstar or their success uh, meeting that they'd had the year before. But the funny thing about it is, is that a couple of the tapes were missing. So what did I do? I bought a couple of the sets. I bought one year and then I bought another year and I figured if I listened to enough years and one was missing cassette three and one was missing cassette five, I'd probably get to a point where the information was covered. I paid $20 for this information and I got more out of that $20 cassette pack or more out of the $100 that I paid on the cassette packs than I would out of the entire time that I was at that first brokerage. You see, a whole new world opened up to me. If you're thinking about getting into real estate now, you are blessed with the amount of information that you have from Digital Agent Show to other sales and real estate trainers that are out there with the information that's available in podcasts, 
YouTube, you name it. You have this information available to you and it doesn't count as much to the brokerage, but it would be nice to get that information. You see, I started to implement what I was hearing on the tapes and then I would have to be reined in by my broker. We don't allow that. You're not supposed to do that. That's not something to do. Knock on doors? No, we don't knock on doors. We don't talk to people. We have a brand. People come to us. Now, I might be exaggerating a bit, but what I've since learned is that if you give a person a fish, they'll eat for a day. If you teach them how to fish, they'll never go hungry. The real estate company can play a critical role in helping you to be trained in how to find business and how to work on your mindset and how to set a real estate schedule that you can follow to be consistent. And then that company can be very, very important to meet you where you're at so that as you start to progress in your career, that they have levels of training beyond the initial open house and they actually talk about how to do mastery. They actually mastermind with other agents that are being successful, maybe not in your part of the country or your marketplace, so that you're not in direct competition, but you're able to work with the best and brightest across the country and around the world. The other thing that I found is scripts and dialogues and approaches matter. And being provided that information by a real estate company is second to none. Real estate company has to teach you how to actually get buyers and sellers. And I am surprised, I'm shocked at the number of real estate companies that still don't do this. Mistake number 10. I went to an office that had required office hours, required floor time, required meetings, required conference calls, required time to be in the office when the regional or corporate guest would come in, when their new director of their mortgage affiliate would come in, which I think in a year they went through about five. I clearly remember where a six month stretch where I was required meetings that were a half an hour to an hour each week that was important for the office that I did not really get much information out of. I looked like I was back in that job situation and I was saying, wait a second, I got into real estate for freedom. Because of this and because of being in the office, the environment was also such where the other agents were not thrilled to be asking my questions, answering my questions. And because they weren't tapped into the same training, the same information, we were talking two different languages. We had no translation. I'm talking about how to generate listings proactively and they're looking at a passive approach and we were like two ships passing in the night where we weren't able to communicate about what we were learning. So what I've since learned, there is a benefit to being in a community with other agents. Whether it be in the last year where we've gotten together in certain meetings on um, Zoom or other web programs where we look like the Brady Bunch, but yet we were able to share ideas, we were able to check in with each other. That's very, very valuable. But I don't need to be dictated to as to what hours I have to be in the office. I wanna be with a company that respects me as a professional and individual, makes the opportunity available to me, and then shows up. What I've also found is being a manager of an office I know that when you give proper training and agents attend two or more trainings a month, they double their income. 
All right, so a lot of these mistakes, you're probably wondering, well, Robert, how did this really cost you any dollars? Because if, if I look at it, sure, you had to come in with the office. Sure, you had to uh, do some things. You, you placed your broker on too high of a pedestal, but how did this really impact you financially? And, and it did because it delayed the amount of time that it took me to actually get into sales and actually the point where I was able to cash commission checks. But mistake number 11 is I went with a company that I found out had multiple different payment structures for agents, some that I found out I wasn't eligible for. Now get this, when I started in real estate, remember you don't know what you don't know. When I started in real estate, I was on a 46%, 54% commission split. I got 46% of the commissions and 54% went to my office. As I started to produce and I reached different thresholds and different levels, then I was bumped up to a 50-50. I eventually went to a 60-40, a 70-30, 70 to myself. I got to an 80-20 on the last deal of the year that I closed. So I'd done it. Within a 12-month period, I reached the highest available commission rate that was there at the particular company. I was pretty happy about this, actually pretty excited, until I found out one day that somebody in the office a number of folks in the office were actually on a 90-10. You see, they had an agreement with the company when they had bought another real estate company to try to acquire a market presence that there was a grandfathered in clause. So here I was working, trying to get up to the particular level and I found out that others were there. These other individuals that had these other splits were also allowed to work on floor duty, seniority, other things, but they were there on Monday. They were there on Sunday when the newspaper had come out and they actually were the ones that were able to benefit from the advertisement, not myself. Really never made sense to me from the broker's standpoint because the broker is just gonna make more money off of me because I was on a uh, lower split to myself but also thinking about it from the broker's standpoint, they were giving it to the individuals who they felt could actually close the opportunities that came in. See, I really realized that favoritism was the norm. So what I've since learned, favoritism is not a way to run a real estate company. Nothing erodes the culture more than creating unequal playing field, especially in the areas of potential pay. When a brokerage, when a real estate company looks at an individual, if they already have a dollar sign over their head of potential and that dollar sign is, next, is not equal, then they are not a fair and equal environment. Not really something that I want to be a part of. Mistake number 12 is that I realized that once I got to the end of year number one, I was demoted back. I sat down, did the projections for year number two, and when I did these projections, I realized that it was actually going to put less money in my pocket trying to hit these particular levels, about $1,200 at the time, and that just didn't seem right to me. See, what I've since learned is I should be no less or no more valuable to the company if I'm one year, two year, five years, 20 years in the business when it comes to a financial aspect. Yes, my reputation may help. It may help with the branding. But again, we talked about branding. Somebody's not going to work with you because Joe Schmo happens to be at that real estate company. They're going to work with you because they like, know, and trust you. And so having a balanced playing field where you are treated equally is very, very important. Mistake number 13. Never realized it until I actually started to sell homes. I'm sure it was in the paperwork somewhere, but the company took out money out of every single check. 
even when I hit that 80% level, they still were taking 20% out of every single check. And it really wasn't costing the company any more money when I was selling more homes. They still had paid for their broker, they still had paid for their rent. I was no more of a demand. Matter of fact, I was actually less of a demand on the company once I got my cassette tapes and once I was actually starting to sell homes, but the company still continued to take money and take and take and take. What I've since learned is you'll have individuals who'll say, Oh yeah, I found a company, I'm on a 70-30, or I'm on an 80-20, but that 20% never goes away. And these companies say, well, we cap the amount. That first company I was with would say they capped the amount that I would pay when I was at 50-50. But all that did was graduate me. It was not a cap, it was a threshold to reach the next payment level. A true cap is when you get to the point where you're selling and you've sold enough homes during that year that the company starts to say, here's 100% of the commission to you, zero to us as the company. And when your clock resets, when your anniversary year comes up, then we will put you back to the same fair commission program that every other agent is there. And you have the equal opportunity, unequal reward to pay up to that cap again and then earn at 100%. So when I hear somebody say, well, I'm on a 90-10 or I'll have companies that will contact me trying to say, why don't you come join us because we're on a 90-10, why would I continue to pay you for every transaction over a particular cap? Economically, it doesn't make sense to me. Mistake number 14 is the company made me cover the shortfall if a client didn't pay for the office mandated $395 transaction fee. See, they had a fee that was on every single transaction in addition to the commissions. And you're probably saying to me, transaction fees, didn't they go away? Those aren't part of the real estate business. They still exist. I know that from talking to the individuals that have gotten into the real estate in the last six to nine to 12 months. When you're dealing with a buyer that is a first responder, that is a teacher, that is working underneath a uh, state program of a, a zero down payment, a veteran that's working on a VA loan, they're scraping together every dollar that they possibly can to pay for closing costs, to pay for inspections, and to add on a $395 fee doesn't make sense all the time. It could make or break the deal. And the company would not allow that to be waived. So my commission would be whatever the split was minus the transaction fee. So what I've since learned, this is not the norm. When you're first signing up with a brokerage, you have no idea about transaction fees, administrative fees, those types of things. There are some companies that I look at and when I actually do that spreadsheet and I get to the point where I'm adding up the administration fees or these transaction fees that get added on to every transaction, even though they say that they cap the amount that they're charging, when you get to that point, you'll realize that you're paying more and more and more and that you really are never at a point where you're at 100%. You also don't have the flexibility as a business owner and as a, a, a steward, a fiduciary for your buyers and sellers to make a decision that, you know, charging this particular fee just doesn't make sense in this particular case. My mistake number 15, I talked about the cassettes that I had gotten. That was because I had to supplement the mistake that I went with a company that had no ongoing training. I remember in the first year being with that company, sure, there was the weekly sales meetings that were raw raws, congrats to this person for doing this or selling a home or this person was the top listing agent last month. And those are all great and it, it, uh, it is, uh, builds a level of uh, esprit de corps, shall we say, uh, when you're able to go into it. 
Although when you realize that some of the people that are being recognized are on a different commission split that you're at that you'll never be able to get to, it's hard to, maybe you get a little golf clap versus being all in for, for what's going on. Um, so from that standpoint, I know that there were only a couple regional training events that were offered that I was able to attend and find out more information. You see, by the end of the first year, I had over a hundred of these cassette tapes that I had invested in. I had acquired them in the same manner, whether it be on eBay or reaching out directly to the companies to be able to do that. If it was not for them, and many times that it was contrary to what the company would bring up to me, but if it wasn't for them, I would not have succeeded and been able to go through in real estate. Having a coach whether it be virtually, they don't have to be right there with you, but having somebody that you can check in with, that you can strategize with, that you could be trained by, it helps if that's right in your own office, but as a new agent, making that investment is very, very important. See, what I've since learned is the real estate school does not teach you how to sell real estate. That is left up to the real estate company. And there are a number of independent brokerages, small mom and pop brokerages that just don't have the time and the resources to train, a lot of virtual, a lot of desk fee only, and a lot of brand-centric companies, they really don't focus on ongoing training. And ongoing training will make or break your real estate career. Now mistake number 16, here's what I actually found out. I found out that the broker was actually competing against me. Now, remember I talked about I had that opportunity to get a listing. I talked to the broker about the listing appointment. This is one of the first listing appointments that I was going to go on. So I showed up at the property, got there early, and as I'm walking into the property, guess who's walking out? That's right. It was the broker. I was competing against my broker. See, what I've sensed learned is there are some times where the broker or the owners of the office need to sell to supplement their income. They're entrepreneurs. I understand that. They have to make a living. I've got no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is I, as an agent, need to have someone that I can turn to to talk about my business to consult with that is not in competition with me. This is where the outside coach comes in, or this is where a position like a team leader is very, very important for me to be able to talk about my goals, my visions, my strategies, what I plan on implementing, and know that next week I'm not going to be in direct competition with this individual. Mistake number 17, I went with a company that required the company information to be large and for my information to be almost a byline on any advertising, any information. I knew that I wanted to send out some postcards to folks that I had met information and the company even offered to pay 50-50 for these to, to match my investment. And I thought that was really grand. So I came up with the design. I had worked with an outside company. They were specialists in marketing, real estate marketing. They came up with the design. They came up with the information. I submitted it into the brokerage and the broker said, nope, you get about one and a half by two inches on the back of the card and that's where your information will go. And matter of fact, the phone number that's on the card has to be the office phone number and they didn't even put my email on there. Now, it was early on in the internet, maybe they didn't know what an email address was, I kid, but my information was fine print. So even though they were willing to pay, they were willing to pay for their number to be prominent. What I've since learned is that you realize that floor time that they were talking about, they wanted the number to be on there and maybe they'll have you as a writer on the sign, but they need that main phone number on there. Now, some states it's required that the broker's number's on the sign and they have to do that. Don't get me wrong from that aspect of it, but your information needs to be on there as well because 
your personal brand matters. My branding, my relationships, my ability to have somebody reach out and contact me and for me to be able to answer questions about a property, about a situation, or work with the buyers and sellers, or me have the opportunity to redirect this to a specialist or a member on my team that knows a particular area, that's very, very important to me. Now, number 18. I talked about this just a bit ago, but I was not allowed to have my phone number on the signs. The signs were the signs were the signs. And I know that this is this has changed over a period of time where I talked about where there are writer signs, those types of things. But again, the brokerage was so focused on trying to say that their brand mattered and that it was because of their reputation and their phone number that the phone was ringing off the hook. I know from doing the uh, floor time, the duty time, that it really wasn't ringing off the hook, but they wanted to have their number on the information so it was able to come in. See, what I've since realized, sign calls are very, very important. A lot of times the individual that's calling off of a sign is going to call and they are a neighbor. They're trying to find out information about what this property is listed for, what this information is, so that they can prepare their house for sale. How many times have you seen it that one house goes for sale in a neighborhood and another one comes up? If I have a real estate sign that has a phone number, and then my number is on a rider, I have a 50-50 chance of that phone call coming to me. Versus if my number is on the sign, I have a 100% chance of being able to have that opportunity or that at bat. Now again, don't get me wrong, some states have this as a particular requirement, but I would rather have it be a state requirement that I've got to live with than the broker putting these types of restrictions in place. Mistake number 19, and as you can see, these went on as I progressed in the business. I started listening to these cassettes. I actually implemented what I was hearing. I mean, I had, I had bills to pay. I had come out of a corporate job and I wanted to try to replicate that salary, if not more, or replicate the amount of money that I was earning. So I started to get busy. I listened to the advice. The advice was, to bring on an assistant. So I started to bring on an assistant and I was discouraged by other agents in the office. I was discouraged by the brokerage. I tried to have, because the brokerage was nice enough to provide me with a desk, I thought, well, you know what? I'm gonna have my assistant sit here because I'm not in the office, only at the mandated times and I'm sitting in the meeting room. Why don't I have my assistant use the desk? Oh, you wouldn't believe the pushback that there was there. And again, I know that this was back in 2001, and you would think that times have changed. It really hasn't. In a lot of real estate, a lot of real estate offices, you'd be surprised. They don't want to see the assistant being in there. They don't want them, even if they're in your particular office space that you're renting, they don't want them to be in there. What I've since found is being with a company that wrote the book on teams that talks about the importance of leverage and using a administrative assistant to be able to assist you in some of the tasks that are allowed by the state that are of greater service to the buyer and seller, then you should be allowed to do so and you should be encouraged to do so. See, real estate agents sometimes try to be everything to everybody. And so this is a mistake that is made that I'm going to talk about here for a second. Yet when you walk into a restaurant, you have an individual that greets you. And then that individual takes you to a table. And then many times there's someone that will bring you or they'll get your drink order. Now this is at the top restaurants for sure because it will be a separate individual than the one that is taking your order. And then when you take your order, notice that it's a different individual that comes and actually brings the food to you. Then it's the manager that actually comes and checks on you. 
And then once you're done with your meal, there might be a different individual that is bussing the table. The restaurant, the service industry has understood that it's very important for there to be specialists and they're trying to create an experience environment. I'll talk about that in other videos. But for right now, let me focus on the opportunity that we have at hand. If you can bring on an assistant, that makes sense. While you're doing paperwork, you're not working with buyers and sellers, you're not selling homes. If you can have individuals or specialists, virtual or otherwise, that are able to help you, you should be able to do so, and your company should encourage it, not discourage it. Mistake number 20. I love this one. The company had protected farm areas. Now, what do I mean by protected farm areas? There was a map of the area on the back of the broker's door. So when I said that I wanted to actually farm a particular area, because I'd heard about this on the, the uh, cassette tapes, they said, great, where do you want to farm? I said, I want to farm in this area. I'd actually gone in the MLS done some details, looked at what the sales were, the turnover, the type of customer that I would want to work with, the price point. I had my spreadsheets, I had my information together because the cassette tapes had told me to do so. I walked in and said, great, that area is not available and I was introduced to the map. And the map, turn around, it was on the back of the door and it had highlighted outlined areas with names that these were the protected areas for agents. But then I also realized because I had some folks that I had worked with that happened to be living in some of these areas, they hadn't heard from that agent in years. The agent had a protected area yet they weren't doing anything with it. They hadn't, if we're talking about it being a farm, they had not planted a seed, they had not watered it, they had not done any marketing advertising whatsoever. So it really wasn't something where they were proactively trying to grow their business. It was something where it was protected for these agents that were already there. See, what I've since learned is a farming area is only as good as the way in which the farmer is tending to it, rotating their crops, being able to market and advertise through this. And when a brokerage protects a particular area, that's not in the best interest of you as the agent, it's not in the best interest of the consumer. And so now I'm pushed out to an area that is so far away from the office that I wouldn't get the benefit of saying, oh, I'm a local agent in this particular area. No matter the neighborhood, if you're able to work it and you're going to spend the time working it, you should be able to do that. The brokerage should encourage competition, not discourage it. And if you're doing your job as an agent, there's plenty of business to go around. You'll be able to succeed. Now, after all of this, I got to a point where I realized that there were other alternatives out there. I realized that there were other companies and I finally got to the point where I talked to the other companies that were out there. I wish I had done this when I first got into real estate. I didn't. It took me about two years in the business, but I finally got to the point where I talked to the other companies. And this brings me to mistake number 21. I realized that I had joined a real estate company that charged me blood money when it came time to leave. I was busy enough that I constantly had listings or buyers that I was working with. I never reached a point where I didn't have signs in the yard or pending transactions or buyers that were in escrow waiting to close. There never was a perfect time to be able to move from one company to the other. What I've since found out is some companies, the way in which they'll treat that is they'll say, that's great, you've done a amount of business with us, and therefore that business that is currently on the books or pending to close, whatever commission split you were on, we're going to um, honor that through the time that it closes, and we wish you the best as you go on to the other company. They may even come up and say, what can we do to make sure that you don't move? And that always kind of is funny to me is why didn't they offer that to me in the first place? 
It's like when they offer great deals to new clients, but not to the ones that are already there. But now we're into that unfairness and I really don't want to be in an environment like that. They charged me on these transactions and they broke me back down to a 50-50 on those closings. So any one of the transactions that were pending, it went back to a 50-50 split. This turned out to be about a $12,000 decision just in and of itself as the amount of money that was left on the table from those things. Now, I made up that money within the next six months at the new company because I was actually on a capped system, a true cap, and so I was able to sell enough homes to be able to get to that point. But I realized that this was, this was something that I didn't really realize. And now with technology, another thing that you need to pay attention to is, is your database your database? Meaning that when you meet somebody, a potential buyer or seller, are you in control of that individual? Meaning that if you leave or go to another brokerage, are you able to take that information with you? Or will the brokerage hang on to either a copy of your database or your database itself and try to market to that individual? That's something that you need to know going in because it can cost you thousands of dollars on the back end. I'm blessed that I actually ended up with a company that when I made a move within Virginia one time and then when I moved from Virginia to Florida a second time that I was actually able to sell my business, sell my database to another active agent who I introduced to the database who started to work with them and it was a win-win situation for them. But the mistake was is that I was with a company that took blood money out knocked me back to a 50-50 commission split for those closings that were able to go. So to wrap up, all of these things and these mistakes were made between 2001 and 2003. Yes, I'm over it. I'm just strictly bringing it up, not to dwell on it, not to be negative, but to share with you as a potential agent or a new agent some of the things, again, you don't know what you don't know. And if you can benefit from one, if not all 21 of these mistakes, then that is fantastic. I also bring it up because in talking with potential and new agents, as I do every single week, I realize that the real estate companies are still requiring agents to do same things that I was faced with back in 2001, 2003. The real estate industry in many ways has not evolved. It is a company centric versus it being an agent centric aspect. And so as you're evaluating real estate companies, which I'd love to talk to you about and be able to answer your specific questions about potentially what real estate company could help you achieve your goals and help you reach the next level. If I could do so, that would be great. Drop me a line, visit Digital Agent Show. So I hope this helps you out. If you like the information, hit subscribe. I'll be providing more and more and more information here on Digital Agent Show to help you launch your career and take your career to the next level. So until next time, make it a great day.